opening prayer. Star six. Hmm. Marcy, are you there? Sister Renee, are you there? Marcia Austin, are you on? Okay. Go ahead. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is the opening 
prayer. Precious Holy Adonai, we come to you at this time praising you for allowing us to come together and to understand and to allow your word to resonate within our hearts. Father, we ask that you will continue to look down upon us with your grace and your mercy. And we pray for all who want to be here, who tried to get here but just weren't able to, Father. But we pray that your grace will be upon us. We pray that you will continue, Father, to give us a mind to be steady followers, Father, and to be studies of the Torah. We honor you. We give you all praise in your mighty, mighty name. We praise you and honor you. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Stephanie, are you on online? We're, no, we're having te technical. Okay. Technical problems. Okay. All right. Is the Facebook up? Yes, it is. All right. Then. I tell you what, I will do the prayer book because I didn't have that in there. So you may be seated. Today is February 18th. <coughs> ah. Humility and submission to me will protect you. <laughs> All right. Marcia needs to be here. We had a very interesting conversation with uh, Dr. Latortu and Marcia, uh, we were talking about, uh, she was considering uh, purchasing a, a pistol. Ooh. Okay, and uh, um, Dr. Latortu was saying, you've got to depend upon God. God is going to protect you. And we had this debate going, okay, going back and forth. And so anyway, I said, I have no problem with you purchasing a gun as long as you know, okay, how to use it. And my concern would be for her son, her young child. But uh, uh, Kwame's father has already taken him out to the gun range and shown him how to use guns and all of that. So nothing there. Okay, now, having a pistol, a gun, a rifle, okay, does not in any way take away, okay, from your trust in God. Unless you are depending upon the gun to protect you. Okay. I say my trust in God is that if I have to shoot that gun, it's going to hit its target the first time I shoot it. Okay. He will direct it if I have to use it. Because we see in the Bible how David's mighty men had what? They had weapons. Even in the gospel, the first time he sends the disciples out, he sends them out with nothing. Mm -hmm. The next time he sends them out, he says, strap your sword on. Mm -hmm. You understand? Mm -hmm. Okay, the mighty men of valor and the apostles, okay, the, his disciples. Mm -hmm. Remember, they were zealots. Judas was a zealot from, the, from that, I'll say, order of Phineas, the ones who were zealous. They were forever asking is this the time that we're supposed to go to war and get these Romans out of here? Okay? So it's not that they were sitting around sipping tea with their pinkies up, okay? No, they were ready to go to war. They were ready to fight. Their faith in God said there's a time for war and there's a time for peace. Even Ecclesiastes said that. Okay, so we had a funny conversation. And uh, um, when we talk about faith sometimes... You know, it's real easy to be brave about certain things and then to have doubt about others, okay? Doubt about our careers, doubt about certain, you know, uh, certain things going on in our life, okay? So at the end of it, we were, we were having this debate about something that was going on, all right? And I, I had to uh, go to the restroom, so I got up and I said, Marcia, get your gun. And everyone uh, looked and I said, because if God can't do that for her, he can't help you with a bullet. Right. You understand what I'm saying, all right? 
So, you know, uh, uh, this title here, humility and submission to me. The only thing that will protect you is your obedience. Mm -hmm. He has no obligation to protect a rebel. Yes, amen. When you see him protecting Israel, it is not because of their goodness. The Bible says, I do this because of my name's sake. Because of a promise he gave to Abraham. The only reason Israel exists today is because of the promise he gave to Abraham. Not because Israel is so good. Understand that. He made a promise to Israel that his descendants would have the land. His descendants would multiply. You understand what I'm saying? So because of that unconditional promise, Israel from the time they were in Egypt was disobedient to God. From the time they got out in the wilderness, they were disobedient. <clears throat> from the time they got into the land, they were disobedient. And how many times and how long was God patient with them? If I could get some tea, please. <clears throat> All right. But God will protect us. Because of a promise that he made. You understand? Because it is through that protection that we get to see the glory of God magnify his name. Not only us, but that those who come against us <coughs> are actually coming against our God. You understand that? And he will stand up for his name's sake. So, humility and submission to me will protect you. I have heard the desire of the humble, and I will prepare your heart and cause my ear to hear. I am great and mighty in power, and I will lift up the humble, <clears throat> but I will cast the wicked down to the ground. The highway of the upright holds avoids evil, and those who guard their ways preserve their lives. Pride goes before destruction, mm -hmm. and a haughty spirit before fall. But how much better is it to be lowly in spirit? For I will instruct the humble in the way they should go. I will prosper them, and I will bless the one who trusts only in me. You who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders, and clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. For I will oppose the proud, but I will show favor to the humble. Humble yourself under my mighty hand, and I will lift you up in due time. Prayer. Father, in humility and submission, I stand before you. I have prepared my heart to do your will, and have strengthened my spirit to follow after your ways. Cover me with your protection. For I have submitted myself to you, to your word, and to your Holy Spirit. Amen, amen. 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 February 19th. Amen. Tomorrow, you are the apple of my eye. <laughs> <laughs> I have probed your heart and tested you. And I know that you have no evil plans. And your mouth has not transgressed against me. You have kept yourself from the ways of the violent by following my commandments. Your steps have held to my paths, and your feet have not stumbled. When you call upon me, I will answer you. I will turn my ear to you and hear your prayer. I will show you the wonders of my great love, and I will save you by my right hand. Because you are the apple of my eye, I will confront your enemies and bring them down. The mighty sword, my mighty sword will rescue you from the wicked. I will vindicate you and you will see my face when you awake and will be satisfied with seeing my likeness and protection. Lord, you found me in a desert land, a howling wilderness, and you encircled me and instructed me and kept me as the apple of your eye. You have promised to shake your hand against those who dare to touch the apple of your eye with trouble. You will cause my enemies to become spoiled for your servants, 
And by this will everyone know that I am your inheritance and you have chosen to dwell in my midst. Crazy thing happened last night. See, God, when he orders your steps, he orders your steps and he gives you an answer. Last night, I could not sleep. So I was up late. We got the uh, reading probably after 2 a.m., okay? And so, uh, anyway, I'm, uh, um, you know, sitting on my bed, and all of a sudden, I hear all this rustling in my closet, okay? And it's like, I know we got termites, but you did some big termites, okay, in there. What's going on? So, I am absolutely terrified, and now I have a little dachshund. So if there's something going on, he ought to be, I'm going to wake him up. Wake up! <laughs> Don't you hear that? He looked at me and went right back to sleep. <laughs> went right back to sleep. Wow. So anyway, I go and I'm stomping across the floor and banging, banging, banging and closing doors and everything. And then just close the door to my closet and go back to bed. Okay, go to bed, and I get under the covers that time, so it's like, if it's Godzilla, it's just going to get me tonight, okay? So anyway, I wake up in the morning, all right, and very sheepishly go open the closet door, okay? And I look in, and I see all this stuff on top of the dresser that I have in there, and all this stuff on the bottom. And I look, one of my isotonics bottles, I keep my isotonics, okay, in there. And one of my isotonics bottles was chewed through. It's like, you got to be kidding me. And so I hear in the spirit, there's a rat in the house. <laughs> I'll see lying on that for a moment. <laughs> There's a rat in the house. Then as I hear that, I go back to the closet. I have vision formula. I have my multivitamin. I have my sweetheart over there. How you doing, baby? I have B complex. But the one he chewed into was longevity. Uh, longevity is for the mind. Yes. I said, I got you. <laughs> for the mind and the joints, how you walk, uh -huh. how you think and how you walk. That was the only one he messed with. Uh -huh. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. I'm saying, okay, Lord, there's a rat in the house. Uh -huh. So I'm a study on rats. Rats are very intelligent. Rats are very sneaky. Okay. Rats go in and out and you don't even you don't even realize they're there until you see the aftermath of what they've done. But I got something for you, rat. Okay. He ate that longe uh, longevity. And trust me when I say what's in that, he may not be here long. Okay. <laughs> be there long. Okay. But the whole thing is... He went after the one that I use to keep my mind yes. and my walk. Yes. Oh, no. You see, God will show you certain things. Okay. And if there's a rat in the house, in your house, after your mind, how you think about things, and how you walk with certain things. You need to start setting up. Some spiritual rat traps. <laughs> okay. <laughs> spiritual rat traps. So, in understanding what I went through, understand how profound this particular prayer was. That they have dared to touch that apple of my eye. You understand what I'm saying? Spiritual rat, tra rat traps are prayer. So you go and let the word of God go before you. Because when someone comes against you, they are not coming against you. They are not speaking against you. They are speaking against the one who sent you. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. 
And people don't understand sometimes why things get crazy in their life because a word that goes forth will not return with it, the assignment not being completed. I have to give someone a warning about prayers they've been praying. Okay? Because when things start breaking out, <clears throat> we often wonder why and not understanding that that word that we are now seeing manifested in our life could be a word that was sent out against somebody else's. You understand what I'm saying? And these are very perilous times. Your words have power. Okay? So just be aware. Are we back up yet? <clears throat> Stephanie, are you online? Star six. Star six. <clears throat> All right, do we have anyone online? Okay. We are, I would like. Can you hear me? Oh, yay! <laughs> Hooray! <laughs> Stephanie! Yes, we can hear you. Go right ahead. Shabbat Shalom. right now okay we need to pray right now for Eduardo's wife okay you know how sick she's been right now and right now she's unresponsive Father God, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Lord, we speak life, okay, into her. Father, you, oh Lord, send your angels round about, Lord, massage that heart, oh Heavenly Father. Breathe the breath of life back into her, oh Heavenly Father. Lord, restore her, oh Heavenly Father, in the mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen and amen. I don't know how long, I'm just hearing, okay, just hearing about that. So please keep Eduardo's wife in prayer. All right, I'm um, sorry, uh, Stephanie, go ahead and uh, continue. What verse were you on? Stephanie, you there? All right, we're not here. You oh, ask. there you go, there you go. Go ahead, what verse were you on? Okay, I was on uh, five, I believe. Okay, verse five. Um, Matthew chapter 15, verse five, everyone. Yes, Stephanie, go ahead. Okay. But you say, whoever shall say to his father or mother, it is a gift. By whatsoever thou might be by profited by me, and honor not his mother, father nor mother, he shall be free. Thus say he have made the commandments of God not effect by your tradition, the hypocrites. Well did Isaiah to prophesy of you, saying, This people draws near unto me with their mouth and honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching me for doctrines the commandments of men. And he called the multitude and said to them, Hear and understand, not that which goes into the mouth defiles the man, but that which comes out of the mouth, this defiles the man. Then came his disciples and said unto him, No one felt that the Pharisees were offended after they heard the saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted up. Come on. <coughs> they be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. 
said Peter, and said unto him, Declare unto us this parable. And Jesus said, And are ye also yet without understanding? Do ye not understand whatever so enters into the mouth goes into the belly, and is cast down into the dross? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceeded evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, theft, false witness, blasphemy. These are the things which defile man. <coughs> but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not. <coughs> Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Very important, very, very important principles discussed here in Matthew 15. All right. Uh, you can see from what um, Yeshua um, talks about, he's teaching from this week's Torah portion and this week's half Torah portion. You see him talking about the commandment honoring mother and father. Then he also quotes from Isaiah chapter 6. So you see how the New Testament ties in, okay, with everything. When you are witnessing to someone about what it is you are learning, this is a very great chapter because you can relate them back to the Torah portion, to the half Torah portion, to show them where all of this material is coming from so that they don't take the New Testament by itself. You understand as doctrine by itself. You show them where it, where it comes from. Now, verse number... Okay, verse number three. Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your traditions? Okay, by your tradition. Okay. For God commanded, saying, Honor thy mother and father, and he that curseth mother or father, let them die the death. That commandment is the first commandment with a promise. Say, kids, let me say something to you. You, oh, kids, I don't care whether you, this kid, this kid, this kid, any kid. Okay, understand that? Cursing mother and father or honoring mother and father is the first commandment with a promise on that. And that promise is that if you do not honor your mother and father, death will follow you the days of your life. You understand what I'm saying? That is a very important, 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 okay, commandment. Because we see that. We see how the younger generation has no respect for the mother and father, yet it is the younger generation that is suffering, okay, right now. Mm -hmm. This is a very important commandment that we need to teach our children how to honor mother and father. But let me tell you something, mothers and fathers, we need, our children uh, need to honor us. Why? Not just because they're, we're their mother and father, but they see something worthy honoring. Mm -hmm. What example are we showing? Coming into Torah is an eye-opening experience. Coming into Torah is a humbling experience. Coming into Torah, I had to go back to my children and apologize and repent to them. You understand what I'm saying? To repent that I was wrong. Okay. There are times when our kids may be right. And the pride that we have will not allow us to accept a child dictating something to us. You understand what I'm saying? Children, when we were in the church, knew certain things weren't right. Yes. <laughs> okay, they knew it wasn't right. And what did we do? Keep on. Keep it up. Keep on. Tell them to shut up. They don't know. Okay. You disrespect me? No, mommy. I'm trying to respect God. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. They knew it. And we damaged them spiritually by trying to force lies down their throat and call it the truth. And in their mind, well, if you can lie about God, why do I have to tell you the truth? Come on. In some cases, we need to repent. We were wrong. Forgive us. You will never know sometimes how you can set your kid free. Okay, by just doing that. Setting them free and letting them know you humble themselves and ask for their forgiveness. All right. Now, what is the tradition he's talking about? Verse number five. 
But you say, whosoever shall say to his father or mother, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. So, in other words, mommy or daddy needs help financially. They go to their child who they know can help them. The child, instead of giving it to mother and father, makes a gift in the temple and thinks that that's what satisfies that commandment by honoring their mother and father. So therefore, it, they in their mind are released of the obligation of seeing to their parents' care. So, what does he say about that? Because of that, you have made the commandment of God to no effect by your tradition. What does that mean? You've taken the word of God and made it to no effect. Now, start thinking back. His word is magnified above all his name. So when you take his word in vain, what have you taken in vain? Him. His name. And what is one of the commandments? Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord of Yahweh in vain. Turn that word vain, turn it into emptiness, make it to no effect. So people think that commandment means you can't curse and all that kind of stuff. No. When you sat and opened up your Bible and read that word and then said, well, that doesn't apply to me. You were taking his name in vain. To take his name in vain like that is called? Black. Black. Thank you. Say, why don't you come up here and preach today? You gotta... <laughs> it's blaspheming. Then he goes, you hypocrites. Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you, say, this people draw nigh to me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips. Oh, we have the great worship services. Okay, the drums are banging, the organs, people running around, dancing, raising hands, talking in tongues. <clears throat> you draw with your mouth, nigh with me with your mouth. You honor me. Oh, praise the Lord. He is greatly to be praised. But the heart is far from me. That's why I tell people when they say, God knows my heart. Um, he says, your heart is far from him. Okay. <laughs> But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. You understand? Go along here and you find about ten different churches, each of them with a different doctrinal statement to say, this is what the word of God says, but this is how we're going to do it. And if you can't agree that we're going to do it this way, you need to go next door and see if they'll, if you can do it that way. <laughs> Doctrines of men versus the commandments of God. That's why I say, you want a close relationship with God? You want to know the will of God? Then simply open up your Bible and whatever God tells you to do, do it. Do it. Okay, so we quote it from... Exodus chapter 20 there. We quote it from Isaiah chapter 6. Then he goes on next principle. And why were they doing this? Because what? They didn't wash their hands. Okay. So he goes on to say, hear and understand, verse 10, verse 11. Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth. This defileth a man. Okay. That word defileth is Strong's number... 2840. I'm going to go back and look at this because I think we need to look at this. <coughs> Strong's number 2840 if you have the key uh, word study Bible. 2840. Come on here. Okay. Strong's number 2840. Okay. That word is to defile, to pollute, unclean. To make common, unclean, pollute, or defile. To pronounce common or unclean. Okay, so this is a scripture 
that those who want to eat anything they want to will throw in your face and say, it doesn't matter what I put in my mouth. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But that's not the principle he's teaching. Okay. He's teaching. Okay. And when he says this, then came his disciples and said, do you know that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this say? And he said, so? <laughs> he answered and said, okay, here's a prayer for you. Got some things going on in your life? that you know are contrary to the word of God, here is your prayer. You need to highlight this verse. Every plant which my heavenly father hath not planted, let it be rooted up. You understand what I'm saying? When I'm going through something, every plant, Everything in my life, Lord, that you have not placed in there that the enemy, because the enemy does what? You're good soil, right? Mm -hmm. So you have wheat, but what does the enemy want to do? Tears. Plant tares. You'll spend yeah. time with tares yeah. and won't have time for the good plant. Mm -hmm. You'll be so worried about those tares coming out. Every plant that my Heavenly Father hasn't planted. Yeah. Every person that my Heavenly Father hasn't put in my life. Every opportunity that God hasn't given to yeah. To me that someone else has come that he has not ordained. Root it up. Root it up. Because once he roots up that which he doesn't desire, you have more room and time to do that which he does desire. Always remember, getting involved in activities that God has not ordained sets your energy. So that by the time it comes around for you to do the things God has ordained, you don't have the energy to do it. In fact, you build up a resentment against it because you're tired. Okay? So everything, remember, the tares took the nourishment out of the soil that the wheat should have been get, getting. How much more of a wheat harvest would he have had if the tares hadn't been there in the field? You see? So tares, okay, tares will always sap your resources, cause you to take time Okay, away from the things of God and bring you no profit in the end. So every plant, you have people like that too, every plant which my heavenly father hath not planted, let it be rooted up. Then he talks about that, let them alone, let them folks alone. That's what he said on Facebook to me too, leave them alone. They be blind, leaders of the blind. Blind leaders of the blind. There are some folk who will not see no matter how much you try to talk to them. They will not see. Leave them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Now remember who he's talking to. And who he's talking about. Okay? He's talking to his disciples that are being obedient and listening to him and teaching them the proper, okay, application of the Torah. And he's talking about those who want to do their own thing regardless of what the Torah says. You understand what I'm saying? Because if you can't see something that is spoken up out of the word of God and be obedient to it, leave them alone. Mm -hmm. don't, mess with, don't take another minute of time with them because they're blind and they will lead other people into their level of blindness. Blind people will lead people who can see and they become blind. Why? Because they didn't want to see it to begin with. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, he sees, leave them alone. Both of them are going to do what? Fall into a ditch. Then the disciples, can you tell us what this means? So don't feel bad if you don't understand a lot of times. Are you also without understanding? Man, he talked to them kind of rough sometimes. <laughs> I talk to people like that, they get offended. Okay, you get offended. Okay? Do you, do you, you yet? 
I'm sorry. Do not ye yet understand that whatsoever enter in the mouth goeth into the belly is, is cast out into the draught. What he's saying, the natural progression of what you put in your mouth is going to come out anyway. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't come out, you need to see me because I got stuff that I help it out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart. What's he saying? What comes, oh, you need to hear what I'm saying. What comes out of your mouth is really a reflection of what is in your heart. Amen. So people will reflect upon you what is really in their heart about you. You understand what I'm saying? Amen. All right? And he goes, those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and that's what defiles a man. Then he goes on to say, for out of the heart, let me tell you something, you better listen to what I'm saying. You better listen to what I am saying. Because this is a very good spiritual principle that when you hear certain things, God is trying to tell you how to judge those things. Because if you hear it out of the mouth, that's what's in the heart. Person is defiled. We need to stop making holy some things. Okay, that God calls defiled. Alright? Because let me tell you something. Every time you speak a defiled word and it goes into your ears, guess what? It helps defile you. Because you'll spend time rolling it around in your head. And then next thing you know, what's going on? You'll speak them things from out of the heart because of what you heard in your ear that rolled around in your head. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay? So when you hear something, you've got to learn how to hear something and not accept something that is not true. Based upon the criteria he says here. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornicators, fornications, theft, false witness. What are false witnesses? What's another word for false witnesses? Liars. Liars. Mm -hmm. What do they speak? Liars. Hello. Blasphemies. <laughs> These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashing hands defileth not a man. God is trying to teach you something, guys. You want to be powerful in the word of God. Okay. Then you've got to begin to understand certain spiritual principles. Now, let me say something to you. God will also, after you learn a principle, he will always give you a lesson to apply it. And then grade you upon that lesson. I'm going to use them to test you to see if you love me and will do what? Obey my commandments. Did you learn anything? That's why it's so important when we come together. How are we going to use this lesson? You use this lesson because now every time I see and every time I hear, I understand if you're speaking defiled things based upon the criteria, what are you? Defiled. You're defiled. And if you're defiled, you're not holy. If you're not holy, you can't be near God. <clears throat> get this size my better size. <laughs> but I don't care if you say you're with God. If you defile based upon this, you aren't. Understand what I'm saying? All right? Amen, amen. 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 Eduardo's not here. Katrina? Star, star six. <clears throat> Shabbat shalom. Romans two and seventeen. 
Indeed, you are called a Jew, and let of the law, and make your vote into Elohim, and know his will, and approve the things that are excellent, and instructed out of the law, and are confident that you yourself are God, who flies light, those who are in darkness. An instructor of a foolish is a teacher of faith, having the form of knowledge and truth and love. You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach the amens do not steal, do you steal? You who say, do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor Elohim through breaking the law? For the name of Elohim is blasphemed among all Gentiles because of you, as it is written. For such is not law, nor is such a circumcision that, you know, sorry, that which is outlawed in the flesh. But he is a Jew, one who is inward and circumcision. This woman is that of the heart of the spirit, not that the letter who prays is not from men, but from Elohim. Allah, Leah. Shabbat Shalom. 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 Shabbat Shalom.
had allied itself with Ephraim. Their hearts and the hearts of their people trembled as trees of the forest sway before us a wind. But the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out with your son, Shear, and in it the son of Tabil. <clears throat> Sister Renee, star six. Bashalom. The ten words. The first word. Exodus 20, verse 2. I am Yahweh, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. In Exodus 34, verse 28, and Deuteronomy 4 and 13, and 10, verse 4, we find the expression, the ten words. In Hebrew, Asoret HaDavarim, which refers to Exodus 20, verse 2 through 17, 20, verse 2 through 14 in the Hebrew version. This is the first of the ten words. The expression, the ten commandments, is not in the scripture. 14 of the 613 commandments are found in these 10 words. It is more correct to say the 10 words rather than the 10 commandments. Since the number 10 in the scripture represents the fullness of something, these 10 words stand as representatives of the whole Torah. The Torah teaches us that these 10 words were written on two stone tablets. Tradition teaches that the tablets had five words each. The first five had to do with the relationship between man and Yahweh. The last five had to do with man's relationship with his neighbor. In the first five words, the name Yahweh is mentioned eight times. In the last five, however, it is not mentioned at all. The ten words go from most to least important. The first are the most important, but the last one is the hardest to fulfill, since it is harder to control your thoughts than your actions. Mm -hmm. The first words begin with the word, I am. Yahweh presents himself as your God in a personal way, in singular form. Each and every person must have a personal relationship with him. The foundation of our relationship with him is the redemption that we have experienced, both the first redemption through Moses and the last, which was made and will be completed through Yeshua the Messiah. The second word, Exodus 20, verse 3 to verse 6. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, nor any image of anything that is in the heavens above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow yourself down to them, nor serve them. For I, Yahweh, your God, am a jealous God. This is the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third, and on the fourth generation of those who hate me, and showing loving kindness to thousands of those who love me and keep my commands. This is the second word. Actually, there are no other gods. See Deuteronomy 4, verse 39, 1 Kings 8, verse 60, 1 Corinthians 8, verses 5 through 6. It, it is rather a question of not accepting something created as a God, as if it were the Creator. See Romans 1, verse 25. This word implies that it is forbidden to place our trust in anything other than Yahweh, to worship idols, saints, or statues, bow down to them, make them, or own them. Here is a question that we can pose to ourselves to see whether we have any other God. Who makes decisions in my life? Where do I place my trust? Where do I place my passion? Who is my life source? Who is my praise? If an idol, a person, a system, an organization, or an object is the answer to one or more of these questions, then I have one or more idols in my life. Come on. Money is the main idol in this world. The greedy will not inherit the kingdom of Yahweh because they are idol worshippers. Hey, come on. As it is written in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 10. Nor thieves, nor covetous, greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. In Ephesians 5, verse 5, it is written, Know this for sure, that no sexually immoral person, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Messiah and God. 
in First Timothy 6 and 10, it is written, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some have been led astray from the faith in their greed, and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Come on. In Matthew 6, 24b, it's written, You can't serve both God and mammon. Come on. Yahweh punishes children because of their parents' idol worship up to the third and fourth generation when there is no repentance. And the children, from the lifestyle of their parents, and when the children continue in that lifestyle, when there is repentance, the curse is broken. See Deuteronomy 24, 16, Ezekiel 18. Because of this command, the rabbis have prohibited the making of any kind of sculpture either of men or animals or of any other object in the universe. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. shall not take the name of Yahweh your God in vain. For Yahweh will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. This is not a prohibition of using the name, but rather of misusing it. Using it in an empty way. In a way without meaning. Rashi says that it prohibits swearing falsely. This prohibition also applies to those who say that they belong to Yahweh when they don't. Oh, yeah. And who present a facade of fearing God when their hearts are not living accordingly. See Ezekiel 36, 21 through 23, 39 and 7. The prohibition of speaking the name of the, of, of the Yahweh is of rabbinic origin, not from the Torah. Therefore, Jews do not utter the Yahweh's name, but rather they replace it with Adonai, Lord, Ahashim, the name of the Yahweh. Remember the day of Shabbat to keep it consecrated. You shall labor six days and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Shabbat to Yahweh, your God. You shall not do any work in it, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your manservant, nor your maidservant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days Yahweh made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore Yahweh blessed this day of Shabbat and made it consecrated. The Hebrew word for remember is written in peol form. This means that it is something continuous, something constantly taking place. Similar to the English term remembering. According to Rashi, it means that you shall be remembering the Shabbat throughout the whole week. For example, if you buy something beautiful during the week, it is in order to honor the Shabbat. In Deuteronomy 5.12, it says, keep the Shabbat. These two words, remember and keep, were uttered simultaneously. Only the Yahweh can utter two words at once. See Psalm 62.11. According to Rashid, he did this in the following verses as well. Exodus 31.14 with Numbers 28.9. Deuteronomy 22.11 with Deuteronomy 22.12 and Leviticus 18.16 with Deuteronomy 25.5. The seventh day, not the sixth day of the first, we cannot replace it with any other day. Yahweh has commanded that this is to be, that this is to be the seventh day of the week. <coughs> at the end of story. <laughs> the Yahweh has staked out a straight path, but man has made it crooked. It is written in Proverbs 21, 8. The way of the guilty is devious, crooked, but the conduct of the innocent is upright. The seventh day begins at sunset on Friday and ends at sunset on Saturday. Jewish tradition tells us which day is the Shabbat. Without it, we would not know which day this is referring to. This shows us that we have to follow tradition in order to fulfill the scripture. A Shabbat to Yahweh your God. That Shabbat is made to be spent on the Yahweh, not for anything else. You shall not do any work in it. The Hebrew word that is translated work is Malachi, which means work, workmanship, production, making. 
The first time that this word is used in Genesis 2, 2 through 3, where it is referring to the work of creation. Malachi has to do with created and productive work and everything that makes an intervention into creation. The work that was required to build a tabernacle was called Malachi. And from the 39 different kinds of Malachi have been derived that are prohibited on the Shabbat. See Exodus 35, 21. The wife is not mentioned in this passage. She is included with the father of the family. They are one. The wife has the task of being a suitable help so her spouse will be able to fulfill together with her what the Yahweh has commanded him. For in six days Yahweh made heaven and earth. The Yahweh is our father. A father sets the example that the children will follow. When he stopped creating on the Shabbat, so we know. in this way we are like him. Man was created in his image and to be like him. Whoever does not keep the Shabbat is not like him in that area of life. Therefore, Yahweh blessed the day of Shabbat and made it consecrated. A blessing is something concrete. Therefore, Rashi says that Yahweh blessed the Shabbat with the man. Being consecrated means that it has been separated from the other days in order to be different and to use solely for the Yahweh. The custom of lighting two candles before the beginning of the Shabbat can be associated with several things. The Shabbat was both blessed and consecrated. The Shabbat is to be remembered and kept. The weekly rest speaks of the rest in the Messianic kingdom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shalom. The reading is the fifth word. <coughs> Doesn't have 2012. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land which Yahweh your God gives you. The command to honor one's parents is among the first five words that have to do with man's relationship with the Yahweh. Our relationship with our parents reflects our relationship with the Yahweh. One who does not honor his parents does not honor Yahweh. One who honors his parents honors the Yahweh. The first five words are summarized in the commandment to love the Yahweh with all your heart, all our soul, and all our might. See Deuteronomy 6, 5, Matthew 22, 37, 38. The five last words are summarized in the commandment to love one's neighbor as oneself. See Leviticus 19, 18, Matthew 22, 39, 40. This is the first commandment with a promise. See Ephesians 6, 2. Honoring one's parents gives a long life on the earth. To honor means to respect with attitude, word, and deed. To honor also means to help them with their material and practical needs, as it is written in Matthew 15, 3 through 6. He answered them, Why do you also disobey the commandment, the command of God, because of your tradition? For God commanded, Honor your father and your mother, and he who speaks evil of father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, Whoever may tell his mother, or who may tell his father or his mother, whatever help you might otherwise have gotten from me is a gift devoted to God. He is a gift devoted to God. He shall not honor his father or mother. You have made the command of God void because of your tradition. To honor does therefore also mean to give financial help. The Greek word that is translated tradition in paradosis, here it means a teaching that has been passed on from a teacher to a disciple. See Galatians 1, 14, Colossians 2 and 8. This is not a question of custom. Yeshua is attacking the false teaching that breaks the commandments of the Torah. Yeshua attacked these traditional teachings in certain cases. 
In many more cases, however, he accepted them. A traditional teaching is not the same as a cultural tradition or custom. Our rabbi did not criticize the Jewish cultural tradition and custom. By his own actions, we can see that he followed them. Cultural tradition has to do with behavioral patterns and traditional teachings our interception, our interpretation of the Torah that have been passed on from teacher to pupil. The Greek word that is normally translated as custom is ethos. It is found in the following places in the Messianic writing, Luke 119, 242-2239, John 19:40, Acts 6:14, 15:1, 21:21. The sixth word. You should not murder. This is not talking about carrying out a heavenly judgment on someone that has been condemned to death, but about murder. The punishment for murder is execution. Leviticus 24 and uh, 17. The seventh word. You should not commit adultery. This is talking about being unfaithful to a marriage covenant by having by having a sexual relationship with a third person. See Ezekiel 16, 32. With this act, the covenant is broken. The punishment for adultery is execution. See Leviticus 20, 10. The eighth word, you shall not steal. This is interpreted as a prohibition against stealing a person. Since in Leviticus 19, 11, there is another prohibition against theft in connection with material goods. The punishment for kidnapping is execution. Exodus 21 and 16. The ninth word, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. This is mainly speaking about not giving false testimony about anyone in a court hearing. However, it also means that we should not say things about another and we should not lie. One of the most severe ways of giving false testimony is one speaks the name of Yahweh, things that he has not said. That crime is punishable by death. Deuteronomy 18 20. False testimony leads to the ruin of society. It causes the innocent to be punished for things that they have not done. It does also cause theft, murder, oppression to go unpunished. Anyone who gives false testimony brings ruin over the world. In Deuteronomy 19, 15 to 21, it is written, One witness shall not rise up against a man for iniquity or for any sin. In any sin that he sins at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall a matter be established. If, it's unrighteous, if an unrighteous witness rise up against a man to testify against him of wrongdoing, then both of, the, both of the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before Yahweh, before the priests and the judges, who shall be in those days, and the judges shall make a diligent inquisition, and behold, if the witness is a false witness and has testified falsely against his brother, then shall you do to him as he thought to do this brother. So shall you put away the evil from the midst of you. Those who remain shall hear and fear, and shall henceforth commit no more any such evil in the midst of you. Your eyes shall not pity, life shall go for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. In Psalms 34, 11, 13, 11 through 13 is written, Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear, the fear of Yahweh, who is someone who desires life and loves many days that he, that he may see good. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. Okay. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19, it is written, There are six things which Yahweh hates, yes, even seven, which are an abomination to him. Hearty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are swift and running to mischief, a false witness who others lies, and he who soars discord among the brothers. Proverbs 12, 22, 19 and 5, 9, 25 and 18, it is written, Lying lips are an abomination to Yahweh, but those who do the truth are his delight. A false witness shall not be unpunished. He who pours out lies shall not go free. A false witness shall not go unpunished. He who utters lies shall perish. A man who gives false testimony against his neighbor is like a club a sword or a sharp arrow. Mm -hmm. Gossip and slander are among the things that would, would the most, <coughs> that would wound the most, and they have the ability to murder a person, and it's written in Leviticus 19.16. 
You should not go up and down as a slander among your people. You should not stand against the life of your neighbor. I am Yahweh. Proverbs 10 and 18, it is written. He who has hatred has lying lips. Who, uh, he who utters slander is a fool. Revelation 21, 8 to 27, it is written. But for the cowardly, unbelieving sinners, abominate, abominable murders, sexual immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their part is in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. There will in no way enter into it anything purveying or one who causes the abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's You have to know when you are seeing things in life, okay, that you see the principle of it taught to you in the Torah. And I really think, and I hate to say this, okay, that we are still a little bit too religious. Because religion will have you coming here, doing your weekly Sabbath, whatever it is you know you want to do, attendance to God, and then go on out and do whatever you want to, not understanding God is trying to teach you something, okay, for your walk in life. So that when you see things, you know what's going on. Going back to this, in Deuteronomy, where it says in Deuteronomy 19, 15 through 21, and it talks about witnessing. Can anybody think about anything that's happened this past week that would apply to this? Hmm? Mm hmm? Anybody, anybody else? Nobody else. Anybody look at the news? Oh, yeah. yeah. Anybody awake? Yes. <laughs> hmm? What in particular? I'm looking for something in particular. False testimonies. Uh, false witness. Oh, yes. Okay, now, let's read this again. One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin and any sin that he sins. At the mouth of two witnesses, or at the mouth of three witnesses, shall a matter be established. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you first of all, you can never condemn somebody just on the basis of testimony of one person. There must be corroborating testimony. Okay, must be corroborating testimony about something that was done wrong, or in some cases even done right. We'll get into the other one later. If an unrighteous witness rise up against any man to testify against him of wrongdoing, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before Yahweh, before the priests, and for the judges who shall be in those days, and the judges shall make diligent inquisition. And behold, if the witness is a false witness and has testified falsely against his brother, then you shall do to him as he thought to do to his brother. So in other words, a false witness, the punishment that would have occurred with the one that you gave false testimony against, shall be the punishment that you receive. Now, can anybody tell me an example of what's going on right now that could fit this? Okay. No. No. Ah, no, still not. Mike Flynn. Yes, you lied to me. Okay, our national security advisor. Okay. A lot of false things. Understand something. God has us as a witness. We are a witness. When we see certain things, it is our responsibility to witness. These are very serious times. Okay, very serious times right now. My fear, once again, the reason I'm going through this, 
Because if you don't know how to see God's truth when it is applied to everyday life, I'm going to tell you right now, each of you might as well go ahead and get a stamp and put it on your forehead. You understand what I'm saying? All right. We talk a lot about, all right, and like you had said, false media and things like that. False media is not false when it's telling the truth. Now, truth all, always must be corroborated by what? Witnesses. You understand what I'm saying? So if a witness is a person that sees something, that has examined something, found the truth behind something, presented it, it doesn't matter, okay? It does not matter if you don't want that to be the truth. This nation is in trouble. Uh -huh. We are in trouble, okay? Because we've gotten to the point where we will call good evil and evil good. We don't know the difference between the two, and I don't care who's getting mad at me right now, okay? I really don't care, okay? Because there are things going on in families. I've been crying for days and I'm a little bit tired of crying seeing families broken apart. Okay. Blood is on people's hands. Blood is on people's hands right now. Certain things that were evil should have never happened in this country because we have a church that is so proud and arrogant. This is no accident that these scriptures are coming up and we are walking through this time day by day by day right now and we are seeing this. We have someone who leads a cheer, lock her up, lock her up, and where is he getting ready? They're thinking about doing with him right now. Huh? Come on, say it. Lock him up, lock him up. Whether you, truth is truth. It doesn't matter whether you like a person or not. You open your mouth against a person with a lie. You are in danger. A false witness will incur the punishment that would have occurred to that person. So when we do things that cause another person pain and loss, you will be in the realm of death as long as that person is. You understand what I'm saying? It's going to take a move of God right now, okay? A move of God right now to bring some order out of chaos. I saw a video today of a soldier, okay, who had passed away, all right? He came, uh, I guess, to his family on a commercial flight. So uh, during the flight, they asked everybody to please sit still because they wanted the soldier's body to come off first. And so they had the, they showed somebody was filming it through the window, showed the uh, casket coming down, you know, out of the plane, and then showing the wife come over and just lay on the casket. And all I could do was cry. And you heard people in the plane crying and crying and crying because all I could think of was that man died. He died defending a country so that we could have the rights within this country. And how many, how many, when we look at each other with hatred, when we look at each other with the division that is right on now, okay, that we are experiencing now, how many die for our freedom and the right to see America as a land of opportunity? And families are being broken up. Children are crying, living in fear, hiding out in churches. This is wrong. And America is going to pay for what she is doing. 
Mark these words. Okay. Mark these words. There is blood on our hands, and I'm not talking about abortion. There is blood on our hands. Next week, our Torah portion from Exodus 21, verse 16, says, He who kidnaps a man, whether he has sold him or is still holding him, shall be put to death. Come on. We are a nation that built our wealth on the back of stealing, kidnapping free people and built our wealth on slaves, built our wealth on stealing this land from the Native Americans. And we think God didn't see just because he allowed 200 years of prosperity. And we want to know why there's chaos? Guess what? It's going to get worse before it gets worse. Okay. Until we can admit that we need to go back to these commandments. Not giving false testimony against our neighbors. We want to know why our children are going crazy. We want to know why the divorce rate is so high. Okay. Is it any wonder to a nation that has forgotten her God? Listen, I'm sorry, maybe you didn't come here for this, but somebody needs to say it, because they certainly aren't in regular churches today. Okay, I'm sorry, they just aren't. Okay. We've gotten so arrogant, been looking at cancer rates. Cancer rates are very high in areas where there's spiritual arrogance and pride. Certain types of cancers. Okay. All right, that's a, another thing we'll do at a biblical health seminar. You know, these are very perilous times, very perilous times. And this is a time to look within ourselves and say, God, show me what it is that is within me that would even entertain, would even entertain somebody coming to me with a lie, a lie, and, let, and having me to believe it. What is it within me? These are things that we need to look at because God is talking to each of There is not one person here who is going to be able to go away and say they did not hear the Ten Commandments today. <laughs> heaven and earth, heaven and earth. Oh, that chair you're sitting on is witnessing. <laughs> Mr. Chair, will you come up for testimony? <laughs> Put your leg on the Bible and swear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? All creation <laughs> will witness. All right. We are meant to be the light people. We are meant to go out there and make a difference. But if the church can't make a difference, what are we doing here? You understand? What are we doing here? If your will for yourself is not to leave here and make a difference in someone's life to bring them closer to the word of God, then please do me a favor, hang up or leave. God gives us breath, okay, so that we will be able to go make a difference in someone's life this week. Will you promise me that's what you're going to do? Okay. I want you to really go over this, and um, I was going to have the kids do a, uh, a reading, which would probably terrify poor Ebony sitting there, sweat popping off her head. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but we'll do that another time. Get yeah. my eye on you. <laughs> Get my eye on you. Okay. And so, because I want to bring our children up. Okay, to bring that word out of their mouth, too. Okay, you do okay. <laughs> He's scared. She probably won't come to church anymore. No. <laughs> all right. This next word, all right, is very important that, that Andre, Andrea is going to read. We are getting ready to get involved, okay, in a project, which I won't tell you now. Okay, but uh, uh, will be a, a kind of an important project dealing with some youth in California. I'm kind of excited about it. 
If you remember on Thursday, there was another minister that was online, okay, and we had a conversation with that minister yesterday, and she's involved in an, a, just an awesome pro, uh, project that she has a burden to do for disadvantaged youth up in their area, and we're going to be a part, okay, a part of that. All right, so lots of opportunities opening up to minister and everything. And we were talking about your finances, different things like that. And then once again, 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm feeling impressed. Go look. Uh, Brother Hightower has a word for you. And up it popped, first thing. And I said, this is it. Andrea, are you online? I am online to Bot Shabon, and let's make a difference. Hello. All right. Let's start the reading. Um, title, Dead Financial Situations Raised Up to be the living voice of the testimony of financial miracles by the finisher of our faith, by Moses Hightower. And he, and he writes, these words came unto me. Today I have brought the restoration of all things into your life. The canker worm, the palmer worm, the locust, the dog, and the wolves were devouring your riches. The rich prayer life I gave you was being devoured in the cash pool of selfishness, pride, and self-righteousness. I will not suffer the things that I freely gave you to be consumed by the evil of the hour. As a child, you were being blinded by the subtle things that have blinded so many. However, the same grace that I saved you by uh, you by came to you again and removed the blindfold of darkness from your heart and mind. I have sent um, complacency back to the pit. Hallelujah. Pride has been dethroned. Laziness has been exiled on its own island. Selfishness has been trampled by the feet of praise and defeat has been silenced by the voice of my word. I have turned your head towards the hill where your help is stationed. With the trans, with the trans given um, by divinity, you are now focused on me, the Savior, with a um, with the Savior, with a focused mind and a focused heart. You are now offering praise to the God who loves you with an everlasting love. No longer are you satisfied with just being blessed. But you are consumed by the consuming fire of my love and a new desire for a relationship with the fire of your life is resident in you. Look to, look to the nail-scarred hands again and behold the blood dripping from my hands. Look again to the nail prints in my thighs and see the blood cleansing, uh, cleansing running down as mighty falls to wash you from your sins. Look again to the blood dripping from my own brow and behold the sound of peace that comes from the voice of yes. my blood. My peace I have given you. My peace which has picked you up in the arms of love kisses you with the lips of quietness. You are carried to the new dimensions in heavenly places by the same arms of love. I will not forget your labor of love for my name. When others did not access the faith and the grace and go forth and preach by my gospel, you found grace in my sight. Why do you doubt the same grace to fulfill what I have started in you. The attack of the enemy and the doubter of evil speculators cannot send my word back hey. unfulfilled. Yes. No. Of the truth that I will do what I said I will do. And not one word will drop to the ground unfulfilled. Thank you. These are my words that you are writing and they will not pass away. Have I ceased to speak to human vessels because the Old Testament prophets have died in their flesh? Come on. Am I weak? Am I a weak God that is not able to rise up and to 
be my spokesman of the hour. There are miracles coming in the yes. future. The miracles are of magnitude yes. that you will not believe. Not even if a preacher told you. Prepare the way of the miracle. I have raised you up from the deadness of prayerlessness. I will not raise up your dead financial situation yes. to be the living voice of the testimony of financial miracles. Look to me, the author. Now look to me, the finisher. Yes. I am one. I am the same. I will do greater things for you in the end than I did for you in the beginning. Only believe. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Oh God, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I have to share that word in writing for everyone to take with them. Okay, that's a powerful word. And uh, uh, Andrea knows what we were talking about yesterday. And you see how, how fast, see, understand something. When you decide to set your feet exactly in the path that God has ordained. Let me tell you, when God ordains things for you, it's not according to your flesh whether you like it. Oh. Okay. Nine times out of ten, you probably want to have done something else. But he says, if you will delight in me. I will give you the desires of your heart. That doesn't mean what you want to do, he's going to give you. That means when you delight in him, he will place desires in your heart for you to love. And then he will bring them to pass. So when you are committed to set your feet in the path and do it in spirit. Fight of the opposition around you. Get ready for the miraculous. Get ready for the miraculous. Get ready for the miraculous. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, I have seen God work in so many miraculous ways in this ministry. You know, so many times. Okay. And you know, I think of Brad and how God created a whole music division. And how he brought his song up to, up to the top of the charts, okay, to preach the gospel. Because he had a desire and to be faithful. You know, I give him kudos right now. He's on vacation. But on that little vacation didn't stop him from sending out Thursday nights, okay, and stop him from doing his daily text, okay. He's on call because that's what his calling is. All right? So many of us, we go on vacation, and what do we do? We forget about the things of God. Come on, yeah, we do, because I'm on vacation. You don't understand. You went on vacation, uh, you packed the bag, and the devil packed the bag to go on vacation with you. Uh, he don't stay home, and he doesn't stop, okay? He doesn't stop, okay? Let's go this week. Hmm. All I can think of is let's go back to our half Torah portion. I could get all day into this uh, article here, but I'm going to have you read this. I only have a couple minutes, so. All right, so make sure you reread this again. Go over all those scriptures, okay, that are in there. That's your homework assignment. Now, one of the most profound things I did see from that article, all right, is the idea, the ten words. We call it ten commandments, but it is ten words. And those ten words represent ten, the number ten, representing entirety. So those ten words represent the entirety of the Torah. Okay, see lot on that a moment. So therefore, when you confess the ten words, you're confessing the entirety of the Torah because that was God's intent. So how are you going to accept the ten words but not accept the rest of it? Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay, now, another thing that I was reading, which really made sense, and I never thought of it that way. Typically, we always see the Ten Commandments on two, um, and I'm pointing uh, Facebook. Um, do me a favor. Kind of go over to that wall, 
Okay, so that they can see the uh, 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 Ten Commandments, okay, on that picture there. Isn't that typically how we always see them? Yeah. Okay. One commentary that I, uh, uh, that I read had said, they were not listed five and five on two. They were listed ten and ten. And the reason that they were listed 10 and 10 was so that one copy would go in because whenever this is a covenant, mm -hmm. one copy goes into a place for like the Ark of the Covenant, mm -hmm. the other copy stays with you to read it. I want you to think about that. And w listen, whenever you have a contract, don't they give you a copy and they keep a copy, am I right? Yes. Okay, so that each of you have a copy on what was signed, of, oh, come on, Holy Ghost, yeah. and what was agreed to. So one copy would go into the Ark of the Covenant for future generations. The other one would remain with Moses with the present generation. You understand what I'm saying? And I said, you know what? That makes sense because what if one of those had gotten lost? Okay, so it just made sense. Now, don't go out, start any, you know, <laughs> one one tablet religion. Like we got two houses, three houses, outhouses. Uh, all right? So, but once again, that made sense to me. That God would write it on both those tablets. Give one which he commanded to go into the ark. And the other would be as a witness within the people to be passed down from Moses to Joshua so it just made sense made sense okay so made sense on that Isaiah chapter 6 Isaiah chapter 6 this jumped out at me today all right this chapter, uh, all of you know the testimony of my uh, uh, mother's passing and everything. And my mother uh, passed, okay, on June 3rd, 1999. June 3rd, 1999. Um, when she had passed the day before, a uh, day or so before she passed, they had placed a uh, very elderly woman okay, in her room, blind and deaf, but this woman kept singing one thing. All she would sing is just one thing. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with his glory. That's all she would say whenever she opened her mouth, okay? And when my mother was in the last stages of passing, that's all you could hear through the entire hospital, this woman singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with his glory. After my mother passed and I went home to contemplate everything that had happened with my mother, because my mother's last words to me, she grabbed my hand before she fell into a coma that last, those last couple of hours. She grabbed my hand and said, Charlotte, go tell the people God is in control. Tell the congregation God is in control. I was working for Chase Manhattan Bank, okay, an officer with Chase Manhattan Bank, second vice president. After my mother passed, okay, this was in New York, and I came back, I put in my resignation because I've always kind of been and try to be an obedient child. And to me, honoring my mother and father was to do what she said, go and tell the congregation. So I went into the ministry full time. I was already a licensed minister with the United Pentecostal Church for several years, but I went into the ministry full time, okay, at that point, because my mother said, what? Go tell the congregation God is in control. But that night when I went back and contemplated everything, I recognized what that woman was saying from Isaiah chapter 6. My son's name was Isaiah, okay, also. So when I went, when I went, Okay, went to um, Isaiah, okay, and I read, in the year King Uzziah died, Uzziah was Isaiah's beloved king. And see, Yah did not call him into the ministry until after that beloved person in his life died. Walking in the path, okay? So, 
I beheld my Lord seated on a high and lofty throne, and the skirts of his robe filled the temple. Sarah stood in attendance on him. I had, I'll say, an angelic experience with my mother in the hospital. And one day I'll go through all of that again. For time's sake, I won't, okay, at this point. All right? But I could relate everything that was going on with my mother, I could relate to. And then I began to perceive God was calling me out and calling me into something different than what I had been in before. 1998 is when I began experiencing the first beginnings of Torah and that I will say that's when I was studying Ezekiel chapter 8 and Ezekiel chapter 8 talks about Tammuz and when I studied Tammuz that's when I came up with Christmas and Easter and the Sabbath and then when I began studying it historically, came up with why the Sabbath day was changed, how all of these things were changed by man and not God. All right? And that's when I began to not know particularly what to do, but I did know I could not continue doing what it was I was doing. It was not until 2001 that I finally made the break okay, with the church that I was with, okay, but had been in the Torah doing the, and I'll call it my version of the Sabbath, in that on Friday nights I would always teach a Bible study, and on Saturdays I would always teach a Bible study, because the word said to be where? In the synagogue on the Sabbath day. So it was kind of sly. Nobody knew what it was I was really doing, but I knew what I was doing. This was my way of doing it until God directed me otherwise. So, Okay, each of them had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his legs, and with two he would fly. And one would call to the other, holy, 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 Yahweh Zebaot, his presence fills all the <clears throat> earth. The doorpost would shake at the sound of the one who called, and the house kept filling with smoke. I cried, woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips, yet my eyes have beheld the king, Yahweh Zebaot. So that was his spiritual experience that he could not have until after Uzziah died. Now, this is not Isaiah chapter 1. You understand what I'm saying? This is Isaiah chapter 6. Five chapters before there, he was already prophesying. But it wasn't until this that God calls him and then changes his ministry. And uh, understand that. We have to go through the rest of this chapter. Verse number 6. Then one of the seraphs flew over to me with a live coal, which he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. Now, in verse number 4 and uh, or verse number 5, what did he just do? I want you to think. What did he just do? He confessed his sin. He repented. Okay? Next thing that happens, one of the seraphs flies to him with the live coal, okay, which he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The altar, once again, altar of sacrifice is a place where sin is judged. A place where sin is judged. And what does he do? He touches it to his lips. Because now that coal from the altar is holy. Fire purifies. Now what comes through those purified lips? See what God is doing. If I want to make you my emissary, I've got to purify. That's why I understand something. Man does not anoint a prophet. So all these people coming out of these prophetic schools with a certificate, you need to leave them alone. <laughs> Come on. I studied at the school and they gave me and ordained me as a prophet. God ordains prophets. Man does not ordain a prophet. Okay? Some of the prophets online now say, oh boy, stop praying them witchcraft prayers. They'll come back at you. Okay? He declares, now that this has touched your lips, 
your guilt <laughs> shall depart and your sin be purged away. I bet you that was painful. Okay, think about it. Purifying. But once again, what are we supposed to be? What lays on the altar? A sacrifice. Ooh, my wow, hair getting too long. Okay, a sacrifice. So Isaiah becomes what? A living sacrifice. Okay, a living sacrifice. Okay. Then I heard the voice of my Lord saying, Who shall I send? Who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. Now he says, Go say to that people. And this was very insightful to me when I read the commentary. So we're going to read the verses, then we're going to go to the commentary, which is why I like you guys to have the Jewish study Bible so that we can study and read the commentary that goes along with it to get additional insight because it's the insight that quickened me this year. All right? And so he goes, then I heard, okay, hear, go say to that people, hear indeed, but do not understand. So understand something. I speak, but you don't understand a word I'm saying. Okay? Now understand something. That is a sign. So that the more you speak, the less they will understand. The more you show someone something, the more they will deny it. It's a sign. He goes on to say, see, but do not grasp. You can see it right before you. Someone can show you the truth and you will refuse to believe it. Dull that people's mind. Remember the rat stole the uh, 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 <laughs> supplement that had my mind, okay? And that particular formulation is the formulation the Chinese medicine used for Alzheimer's. Okay, so I'm looking at all of this and contemplating on everything that's going on and I'm reading this. Dull that people's mind. Okay, stop its ears. So when you use a tool in an incorrect manner, you can dull it, am I right? Then you have to sharpen it. The word of God is called what? A two-edged sword. So the more you use that, with these people, it's going to dull it. They're going to be duller and duller. The more you talk, the less they are going to understand. Okay? Seal its eyes. Okay? So close their eyes. In other words, eyes are open, but your words are going to close their eyes. Why? Because seeing with its eyes and hearing with its, with its ears... It also grasp with its mind and repent and save itself. In other words, if they truly acknowledge that which they saw and would admit to hearing the truth that they heard, they would then understand and then it would cause them to repent and save it themselves. You understand what I'm saying? So he has, now understand how deep this, this is deep. Don't go, the purpose of you going is not to give my people any additional insight. The reason that I'm sending you is that I'm so sick and tired of them people. I've determined, okay, determined them for wrath. So the more you speak, the less they are going to understand. They say they see, I'm going to show them the truth, but they won't be able to see it. They will have enough evidence before them, but they will refuse to believe it. And you are going to be my agent for that. It's real easy to accept a commission when you say something and everybody's supposed to believe it. Come on, that feels real good. But the purpose of this prophet changed because for five verse, five chapters, he was going to them Telling them what God said, but they refused to repent. They wanted it their way in spite of the proof that was set before them. Now, let's go down to the um, commentary. Verses 8 through 13. All right? 
the commissioning. Repentance is no longer an option. Repentance is no longer an option. The title for today is Repentance is No Longer an Option. Okay? Isaiah is told his mission. So you see, Isaiah is now commissioned with a specific, a specific mission. Shockingly, the prophet is not supposed to help the people understand the danger to which their sinfulness exposes them. Cross reference in Isaiah 29, verses 9 through 10, 12. God no longer desires repentance. Rather, God wants to vent divine anger on the nation. Oh, you don't hear what I'm saying. You do not, America, you do not hear what I am saying. Okay, with this, there comes a point where you cross a line where God will not allow you to repent. Hello, Pharaoh. Ask Pharaoh. We need to ask Pharaoh about that if we ever see him. Okay. Some rabbinic commentators, unable to imagine such an interpretation, argue that imperative verbs must be taken as future tense verbs. Hence, God does not order Isaiah to cause the people to misunderstand. Rather, God predicts that they will not achieve understanding in spite of Isaiah's speeches because the people do not want to acknowledge the truth. It is hard for people to believe in a God that would ordain his wrath. It's very hard. So it's easier to think something else. Mm -hmm. yeah. But let me tell you, as a person, as a people, as a nation, there comes a time when you will cross the line with God. Let me say something. If he did it with his people called by his name, we need to stop being so arrogant to think he won't do it over here. He gives you the criteria here. You know what the sign is? People are not going to believe in spite of any proof you show them. They will continue to believe in alternative facts. <laughs> Why? Because they don't want to acknowledge the truth. That's the sign of a people getting ready to incur the wrath of God in their nation. Verses 11 through 12, let's read them first. I asked, how long, my Lord? And he replied, till towns lie waste without inhabitants, like the terebinth and the oak, which the stumps are left even when they are felled, its stumps shall be a holy seed. So he's going to leave some. He's going to give me some more time right now. Okay? Now, here's the profound part. In the reign of Ahaz, son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah. Remember by this time, Judah and Israel are two different okay, countries. Okay? There's the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom. Judah is the southern kingdom. Okay? King Rezan of Aram. Remember a couple of weeks ago we discussed who is Aram? Syria. Yeah. <laughs> Syria. So we have Syria and King Pekah, son of uh, Remaliah of Israel, march upon Jerusalem to attack it. But they were not able to attack it. So the plan was coming from Syria... Okay, they were planning an attack against Israel, but they weren't able to do it. Why? Let's look here. Okay, verses 11 and 12 in our commentary. The divine judgment will involve the exile of most of the nation. Okay, um, verse number 13, I'm going to read down a little bit. A small remnant will repent after, after the disaster. Kind of hard. Okay? From this kernel, the nation will be renewed. The renewal involves not the exiles who return from afar, but the survivors who remain in the land. 
Thus, Isaiah's notion of renewal differs from the vision of renewal in Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and it says second Isaiah. Okay, so you have with Jeremiah, renewal is what? Those coming from Babylon back into the land. However, he's saying those that are left in the land are going to be like a seed through which renewal. So God's renewal of Israel is not necessarily going to happen from those who come back in, but from the small amount that was originally there. All right. Now, chapter 7, we go on. Uh, let me read a little bit. Okay, down on that page. In 1735, I'm still on uh, the page that says 7 through 823. In 735 BCE, the leaders of the kingdom of Damascus and Syria, or Aram, and of the northern Israelite kingdom, also known as Ephraim, attempted to create a coalition of small states to oppose the Assyrian Empire. So guess, don't hear what I'm saying. Don't hear what I'm saying. An alliance with Syria and Israel to attack a common enemy. Can we think of anything today? Russia, who's with Syria, United States, Israel, to attack ISIS. Let's continue. Okay? King Ahaz of Judah did not join their conspiracy. And the Arameans, the Syrians, and Israelites, Ephraimites, marched against Judah, intending to depose Ahaz and replace him with an ally of their own. Oh, we're looking at some political intrigue getting ready to come up when these treaties and everything don't go the way that people want them to. You understand what I'm saying? Okay? Now, um, it goes on once again. Uh, let me see here. Hold on. Okay. Intending to depose Ahaz, replace him with an ally of their own, the son of Kabil. His first name is not given, probably to slight him. Ahaz appealed to the Assyrian king, Tiglat Peleser, for help. The Arameans and Ephraimites did not succeed in their efforts. Damascus was conquered entirely and 732, while Israel lost considerable territory to Assyria, Judah was saved, but it became dependent on Assyria. Lots of things getting ready to go on over there. You understand what I'm saying? That Yah is walking us into with this. Now, one of the things that I wanted to go to, all right, and we won't have time, I'm going to do some of this in a Revelation study. Go to chapter 8. This wasn't part of it. In chapter 8, before we do that, chapter 7, verse number 13. Listen, house of David, retorted, Isaiah retorted, Is it not enough for you to treat men as helpless that you also treat my God as helpless? Assuredly, my Lord will give you a sign of his own accord. Look to the young woman is with child and about to give birth to a son. Let her name him Emmanuel. By the time he learns to reject the bad and choose the good, the people... Will be feeding on curds and honey. For before the lad knows to reject the bad and choose the good, the ground whose two kings you dread shall be abandoned. Yahweh will cause to come upon you and your people and your ancestral house such days as has never come since Ephraim turned away from Judah, that self same king of Assyria. So he gives him a sign. We use this chapter to talk about the virgin birth. Okay, that word can be virgin, but it also can mean a young married, a woman who was a virgin when she married. Now, let me ask you something. How would this be a sign to Ahaz if it didn't occur for almost a thousand years later? It wouldn't have been, right? So that's why I say you need to understand prophecy. Prophecy Okay, there is the now part of prophecy, further future, furthest future. Okay? 
Always remember that. So there had to be something that occurred right then that Ahaz would recognize as a sign. The sign was this woman was going to bear a child and his name would have a meaning given to him by God. So <clears throat> let's uh, um, continue reading. Chapter 8. Yahweh said to me, Get yourself a large sheet and write on it in common script. For Maher shall Ahashbaz and call reliable witnesses the priest Uriah and Zechariah, son of Jerobachiah, to witness for me. And I was intimate with the prophetess. So his wife was a what? Prophetess. Prophetess. Prophet and prophetess. And she conceived and bore a son. You understand what I'm saying? So the sign was going to be the prophetess, which was Isaiah's wife, okay, who would bear a son, okay, Yahweh said to me, name him Mahershala Hashbaz, for before the boy learns to call father and mother, the wealth of Damascus and the spoils of Samaria and the delights of Rezin and of the son of Remaliah shall be carried off before the king of Assyria. So this young woman, okay, bears a child and his name is given a meaning that is a prophecy to happen with the nation from God. All right? So we see that fulfillment right there because it doesn't matter if you ask God for a sign and that sign doesn't come until after you've been dead for, you know, for 2,000 years. It can't be a sign to you. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, so let's go down to, okay, verse number, and eight, verse number, let's keep on going. Verse 11, but this is what Yahweh said to me when he took me by the hand and charged me not to walk in the path of that people. You must <coughs> not call conspiracy. All that people calls conspiracy nor revere what it reveres, nor hold it in awe. None but Yahweh of hosts shall you account holy. Give reverence to him alone, hold him alone in awe. He shall be for a sanctuary, a stone. Men strike against a rock. Men stumble over for the two houses of Israel and a trap and a snare for those who dwell in Jerusalem. The masses shall trip over these, shall fall and be injured, be snared and caught. Bind up the message. Yahweh who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob, and I will trust in him. In other words, if God hides his face, how do you hear it from God? If God is hiding his face, he ain't talking to you. So whoever you are hearing from is not him. But it will be your own flesh, as identified before, because you refuse to believe the truth. So then he goes on to say, Here stand I and the children Yahweh have given me as signs. Do you know that what's going on with you and your kids is supposed to be a sign? We don't understand that. Somebody's supposed to be looking at you and saying, Oh, tell me what God is about to do. Because what's going on with you is representative of what he's about to do with his people. I'm going through this hardship. I'm going through this. I'm going through that. It's a sign. It's a sign. And when you personalize certain things, you miss it. You don't know how to come out of it. Because it was meant for him to give you a sign so that you would know how to pray. He's teaching you how to pray for his people. But you are personalizing it and causing people to pray for you. Not wreck. You've been asking God for a sign. You are the sign. Your children are the sign. What's going on with your kids is a sign of what Yahweh is going to begin doing with his people as a whole. So pay attention, guys. Because you don't know how to protect your kids. Come on. He goes on now. 
Should people say to you, inquire of ghosts and familiar spirits that chirp and moan? For a people may inquire of its divine being, of the dead on behalf of the living, for instruction and message. Surely for one who speaks thus, there will be no dawn. And he shall go about it in wretched and hungry. And when he is hungry, he shall rage and revolt against his king and his divine beings. He may turn his face upwards or he may look below. Distress. A nation in distress. A nation in darkness with no daybreak. Straightness and gloom with no dawn. Why? Because the leader been getting advice from those speaking with the dead. They did. So the only thing they can pray in your life is death. And you're getting your instruction from somebody whose face God has turned away from. So the only voice you are hearing is the voice of ghosts and familiar spirits. Angels of light, ministers of righteousness. He goes on to say, For if there were to be any break of day for that land which is in straits, only the former king would have brought abasement to the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, while the latter one would have brought honor to the way of the sea and the other side of Jordan and Galilee of the nations. Okay. Ultimately, with that sign, God is going to give him a sign to let him know that this prophet is speaking truth to him. And go based on that. God is showing us some things right now, guys. But instead of understanding what God is trying to show us, we get all crazy. You understand what I'm saying? These scriptures are just as clear as day. They're as clear as day. I'm hoping some of you are getting some understanding. Please say yes, because if they're as clear as night, okay, if you are still left in darkness, that is because God has done what? No understanding. You're looking and seeing, and God is saying, this is what you look for. This is how they're going to react. This is what they're going to say. So understand when you see all of these things, that's a sign to you on how I'm about to deal with them as a whole, but I'm going to protect you because I need you as a witness. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody has to be around to tell people that it was God who said these things, and that is what he did. And guess what, guys? It is you. Everybody stand up. The word he gave me on Thursday, remember I said it, are you the one? Or do I need to look for another one? Are you the one? I don't hear nobody saying yes. Are you the one? Let me tell you, if you don't, that chair you sitting on will be a witness. It'll be hopping out here with a sign. Okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, we bless your holy name. Father, I just want to thank you for the awesome and great and mighty things you are doing for your people. Oh, Heavenly Father, and I thank you, Lord, that you are opening our eyes that we can see, opening our ears that we can hear, and opening our hearts that to receive your word. Father, let us be able to discern all the different voices that we are hearing, oh, Heavenly Father, to discern that which is clean from unclean, holy, and from profane, oh, Heavenly Father. For there are many voices that are speaking to the people. And Father, open our eyes that we can clearly see and be able to relate what we see to your word. Because your word is our instruction for how to go in and how to come out from amongst the people, O Heavenly Father. But most of all, O Heavenly Father, open up our hearts. Some of us have had heartbreaks in the past. And some of those heartbreaks, oh Lord, are because we didn't understand our purpose, but the enemy used our purpose against us and caused us anguish and loss. So, Father, this day we're giving our hearts to you, O oh Heavenly Father. We repent, O oh Heavenly Father, for bad feelings that we have had, O oh Lord. We repent 
Because yes, we did have a choice on how we acted with certain things. But Father, where purpose is unknown, abuse is inevitable, and our lack of understanding allowed the enemy weapons of warfare to use against your people. But from this day forward, we say, let there be light so that we, our minds are enlightened, our eyes are enlightened, our understanding is lightened, and we are no longer walking in the darkness of ignorance of this world, oh Heavenly Father. And fill your people with a boldness and no fear, O oh Heavenly Father. That when we go before people, you will place the words, the words that will shatter rocks, O oh Heavenly Father. That will cause blind eyes to see, <clears throat> cause deaf ears to hear, cause the lame to walk, and raise the dead, O oh Heavenly yeah. Father. And we, hey, say, we thank you, O oh Heavenly Father, for all that you are doing this day. And Lord, let each word that we have read, okay, let it not, that we have spoken, Lord, let it not fall to the ground unproductive, but let it do that which you have assigned it to do, O oh, Heavenly Father. Let it not return to you void, O oh, Heavenly Father. And we ask this all in the mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Let all the people say amen. Give God a hand clap. Do me a favor. Let's show everybody. Give God a hand clap. Come on now. Give God a hand clap. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. Everybody give somebody a hug, a handshake, whatever is appropriate.